was your pack of cigarettes a day habit when you quit? Do you remember? Oh, way back in the day, just to, to be clear, uh, I, I was up to a pack a day when I was in uh, early college before I quit. Yeah. Pack a day. Me too. Yeah. You and I both uh, in high school started the ugly habit of smoking. Awful. Terrible choice. I still miss it, though. I'm going to be honest. Well, your brain's permanently rewired as a result. I'm sure plenty of listeners would agree. It never <laughs> goes away, even if you've done the right thing and quit decades ago. <laughs> I do sneak an occasional vacation cigarette from time to time. And actually, oh, yeah? yeah? What's that look like? Uh, you, and I, you and I shared one when we were out in uh, California <laughs> together, so don't, don't try and pretend like oh, you didn't that. Oh, uh, I mean, it was a birthday. I mean, you know, it's, that's okay, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, you know, for all the talk that we do about financial planning for early retirement, you know, financial independence, we do very little health planning and discussion about what, you know, health planning looks like in yeah. retirement. And I know there's been lots of studies done that look at early retirement and the connections to even like a shortened lifespan. Um, and it's a lot of conflicting data. I realize there's, not, there's no kind of one conclusion you can draw from any of that. But I wanted to talk about this with you a little bit today and kind of do a check in with you. See how early retirement has affected your health, if at all. How are you thinking about it and approaching it? Because yeah. you have a lot more time to, say, focus on exercise. You know, I'm, why my wife and I talk about, hey, when we get to, you know, an early retirement date, we can spend lots of time exercising and I'm going to work out and lift weights and, you know, all these things. So tell me about how you're feeling right now, three years into early retirement from a health standpoint. Yeah, it's a it's a big topic. I think there's a great reason it's commonly discussed. It's central to everything, right? And you, if you are going to do all this work to retire early, why not make sure that uh, longevity is a part of that picture, at least as much as we can control it, right? Not everything is in our hands to determine. Uh, so something I've been thinking about a lot over the last three years, and I, I don't think it hurt that the very last months of my career were spent uh, working remotely, like many people. And so that sort of provided immediate opportunity to be thinking about like, oh, well, how do I fit, you know, an extra walk in today? And me and Lori would go out for walks and stuff because it's a little more flexible schedule. But I, I would say that's only increased as I've spent time um, in retirement. I wouldn't say it's been a consistent thing. I've had fits and starts like anything, especially when you throw travel into the middle of it, right? Good habits go out the window. Yeah. But I've definitely spent a lot more there's been a lot more sort of mind share devoted to wellness, uh, longevity, and more recently this idea that I, I'm completely lifting from, uh, you know, really sort of pop culture, popular physician Peter Atia, this idea of health span. Yep. Uh, and so, you know, how do you prolong the period of life in which you're, you know, your your health and your well-being, you know, you're very able uh, and not just your lifespan, right? How long you're literally alive. And so it's very much on my mind in a lot of different ways. And uh, yeah, I agree. Really important topic for us to talk about today. Do you feel like you have better, more healthy routines in early retirement? Do you, have you seen any changes? I mean, I know you were someone who did a lot of traveling before you retired and yeah. you were on the go and that naturally precludes doing a lot of regular exercise and things like that. Yep. Like is life better? Yeah, 100%. Uh, it, it's not perfect, right? I'm, I'm still human. But for sure, I have a lot more routines built in that are with sort of health and well-being as a central element. So whereas, you know, walking and hiking was largely a weekend activity yeah. when I was in my career, other than sometimes where I did do some walks or very early morning, even before dawn. Um, now it's something I can do most days. Some of those times are short walks around our neighborhood. You've, you've seen that that loop. Uh, some of those are with Lori, some are by myself, some are much longer hikes, uh, either with others or alone. But it's something that at least five out of seven days at this point, I would say um, I am doing some kind of hiking or walking or I also use a bike a lot more. Uh, and that was a big goal of where we lived. So, yeah, I would say certainly from an uh, activity perspective, I mean, I'd be giving up a really big opportunity to just sort of implement healthier practices if I wasn't doing that since I stopped working. Cause you know, those kind of excuses all went out the window <laughs> when, uh, you know, the 40, 50 plus hour weeks disappeared. So yeah, I think I'm, I feel pretty good about that. I think the other thing that you touched on was this idea of travel. A lot of people who don't travel for work don't realize how easy it is for travel, just like on vacation 
to lead to not making the best decisions. You might be having to grab food quickly or on the other hand, you're going out for meals at, you know, restaurants. Overindulging and, and, and yeah, anything. overindulging <laughs> is possible, whether it's food or drink or whatever. Um, and, you know, a lot of times at work, we would have lunch meetings, right? That's a sad state of the corporate culture is lunches would often be catered so they can take that hour away from you, too. Um, and so that food wasn't always the same choice I would have made on my own. And so it's easy to just get lazy about it. And now making all my meals, if I want to do meal tracking or prepping, both of which I've done currently or in the past, it's just so much easier. And so I view that as another huge benefit, um, that I can really take advantage of. So that's, that's another area that I would say has changed a lot easier if you have good habits established, but if you're someone like me and maybe you don't have the best eating habits or, you know, I get, it's one of the things that really worries me, Jay, about slipping into retirement is slipping into like permanent vacation mode. And yeah. how have you addressed that? Because I could see myself like, Oh, Hey, every day is Saturday, man. You know, like yeah. it doesn't to put some bounds on it. Like how, yeah. how have you done that? Well, I, I, my answer, I don't know if it'll surprise you or not. It's, but as I think about it here, um, I think what, what I would say happens is on the whole. So 90% of the time, it's pretty easy to have good health routines. And Lori is likewise, you know, doing the same stuff um, that I am doing. And so that makes it kind of a good kind of household decision to be more active, do things to, you know, eat better, to not overindulge. But what I have found is that the other 10% of the time, um, it's very easy to treat it like vacation. Yeah. So I haven't had a problem with treating all of the time like vacation, but you know, <laughs> like when we have visitors, like yeah. when you and Laura came out or when I go visit friends or when we go on proper family trips, it's like, okay, it's vacation. <laughs> um, uh, and then, you know, the, you're not exercising as much or, you know, differently unless it's literally a hiking trip where it's kind of built in. But, you know, you're going out to eat more. Maybe you're, you know, picking up stuff on the road. And, you know, that stuff, if you if you for example, your goal is weight loss or something like that um, or, or macro tracking that when that goes out the window like that, that that puts a derails the path you were on. And so if you are traveling more often well, and you're still treating those like vacations, well, I think that there's real risk there. And I've certainly seen myself having to correct for kind of those uh, those behaviors. And, and sometimes like in the summer, guests could be coming or we could be going fairly frequently. So it's pretty easy to have, you know, a bunch of time where you're like, well, huh, that's not smart. I've completely like derailed very healthy habits of many months. And so I think I've become a lot more conscious of that lately. But uh, honestly, I, I'm not going to say that that prevents it just being aware of it. So yeah, I think there's real risk there. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, so you think it's just habits that you have to just be conscious of it and establish good habits and just it's kind of like that idea I, if i i exercise every single day um yep. and there will be that rare exception where let's say this past week we had this tropical storm come through and that we're getting seven inches of rain there's like i'm probably not going to go hiking that day but i never want right. to miss two days in a row so is it yeah. that kind of thing where you establish like some some rule sets or or what what do you, how do you, you know, know, it's funny. I actually had the thought to have that very, you know, do something like that because actually that was kind of part of my job the last year or so in my career. I was teaching people to do that kind of, you know, operational process management yeah. and, yeah. you know, have visual tracking. Right. And I thought about doing the very same thing. And I think I, in Notion, I had something built two years ago where I started to do that to force some accountability. But I was like, man, that feels a lot like work. So <laughs> I kind of stopped. Yeah. I think I just have kind of, you know, you know, I use a lot of fitness tracking stuff. Oh, okay. um, and yeah. so I, you know, so I gamify got, it. Yeah, I do gamify it a little. Yeah. I have my Garmin watch. I That's like cool. to see my trends continue. You know, I, I use Lose It to track, you know, calories and macros. And so right. um, that helps me. And, and, and maybe, maybe it's just some of those kind of challenges to my personality, little habits I have actually can be put for the positive because <laughs> I like kind of over analyzing things like that. And so for me, I actually find that helps me a lot. So having regular habits around documentation, you know, stuff that's lightweight enough that I'll keep doing it, but that gives me enough feedback and trending that it feels helpful. That is something that has been useful. The other thing I would say is getting a little more um, mindful about this as, a, as kind of a big picture. And so uh, a book that you are aware I read recently because I sent you a copy is Outlive by, by Peter Atia. And you know, the, this concept of health span kept coming up, you know, early on in the book. And I was like, well, that that's clearly the right way to think about it. But admittedly, I wasn't thinking about it that way. But the other, 
I wish I had the direct quote in front of me, but I'll try to lift it and paraphrase. It was something like he was talking about a, a retiree who's a patient of his, and his concept was in retirement, he realized it's now his job yeah. to be more healthful all around. And, and you know, why else would you do this, right? And so I've, I've decided while walking one day listening to this book uh, some time ago, uh, listening to the audio book was like, well, that that's the right way to think about it. So uh, I'm not going to say I've got like big, big, uh, you know, huge actions that are going to improve things versus kind of how I've thought about it before. But I've started to be a lot more, I guess, conscientious about thinking big picture and hopefully more often making better decisions more frequently so that, you know, when you have these odd little, you know, whether they're celebrations or other fun lapses of good habits, like, you don't feel bad about it because you know this is hey you're this is this is the rest of the life right that we've been given i was going to say one of the things and that's a great book by the way one of the things he talks about is kind of four horsemen that he yes. puts up there of things that are probably going to come and get you the kind of slow death right over time that these are all things that start many many years before they actually manifest and so you do have this ability to affect and change those things over the long term you know there's these l little actions that you can take each day and these little habits that you can make and as long as you're conscious of it you can start changing your health span for the better um even That's if right. you've got it completely screwed up now I, and i think the four horsemen sort of chapter you know and here we're talking of course about like metabolic disease cardiovascular disease you know cancer etc the, the big ones um big multi-factor complex diseases, yet they're the most common causes of death, particularly as we live longer and longer and things like cancer, unfortunately, become a bigger and bigger uh, risk for all of us. Um, he doesn't just focus there. And of course, yes, exercise and activity, as anyone would expect in a book like that, plays a critical role. And that has been important to me. But the other thing I really like about the book is that it doesn't stop there. Yeah. There's to topics like stability, right? The fall of, you know, risk of falling is so important as people age, not necessarily you and I, but 10, 20, especially 30 years from now, should we still be among the vertical? Um, that's a huge risk, right? Well, we've both had family members have to deal with that. Um, but it's the other two that I think are so impactful. The other two things in the book, um, you know, uh, sleep which is essential and something I've struggled with for a long time yeah. and, and we can certainly discuss. And then there's mental health and talk about something that's easy to put to the side, particularly when you're working and it's just so easy to just have the excuse of, yeah, I'm just under stress, whatever. Everything's fine. Um, definitely don't need any help there or counseling or whatever. Just going to charge ahead. Well, I'll tell you, um, there's nothing like no longer having a career and that distraction, if you will, to really make you think about like, well, what is my mental health like, right? And and is there something I could do to be happier and be a better, you know, parent, spouse, you know, child, whatever? Um, so the the book caused me to really think about that stuff um, much more than I had in recent years. Yeah, I remember you telling me recently, and this was off air. Yeah. Um, so feel free to <laughs> say what you want about this because it's a very private matter, but. Um, you know, you were saying, oh, I'm going to go, I'm probably going to go speak to somebody. You know, I, I have some questions I want to get answered. Um, so to yeah. the degree which you're comfortable sharing, because I do think there's a lot of stigma around seeking Percent. mental health help. And I know in my family, there certainly was, but I've also seen the positive side effects of seeking that help and really moving through it and seeing a lot of positive change. So why don't you speak to that? Yeah, for sure. And, and I think I would also say, you know, Dr. Atia and the book don't get full credit for steps taken here. This is actually kind of some icing on the cake. You know, I, I'm somebody that's had, you know, the, the opportunity to have a num good number of people within my, you know, family and friend groups um, deal with, manage, you know, uh, have success with treatment for uh, mental health uh, conditions, things like depression, anxiety, right, panic disorder, um, ADHD, et cetera lots of different neurodivergences as well. And so I've seen the transfer transformation that that proper support, whether it's counseling and or, you know, medical therapy um, can have. And yet, you know, while I would have questions about my own self, my own mental health over time, and even have good discussions with family or friends about it, never really took it that seriously. It was like, well, I'm under stress and down the road, things will be a lot better. It's all, it's all good. Um, even though I have lots of <laughs> little, little kind of signs and kind of little, you know, people on my shoulders telling me like, yeah, maybe there's something there, buddy. Um, but you know, it's really only for me 
you know, when I sort of think back about the early weeks after retiring, when I think about some of the things I were writing, I mean, yes, some of that was probably all about things I was missing from work and I was adjusting to that. But I think it was also just really having time to reflect and think about what am I happy about? What things about myself and how I act and how I, my emotions manifest or, or are kept in, right? How does that feel and, and what's the nature of that? And so that got me thinking, um, you know, at, at times, uh, but I would always put it aside, like, well, maybe there's value in talking to somebody, whether, you know, some counseling would be useful, right? I'd seen so many people benefit from just that opportunity to talk through difficult situations or, or thoughts one has held on to for a long time, things that have happened, whatever. Um, but again, didn't do anything about it. And then, you know, very recently had a good friend go through the ringer of uh, a lot of life changes, uh, depression, and then, you know, seeking help, uh, taking that step and just was so positively impacted by that process and, and having a really good conversation with them was one of the things along with the book I mentioned that really finally got me to say, you know what? I have no idea. I might be in great mental health and, uh, <laughs> maybe I'm, maybe I'm barking up the wrong tree, but you know, maybe talking to a psychiatrist would be smart. And so I, you know, took, took that first hard step, you know, did some research, found some local folks and, uh, yeah, I had a, had an appointment and, and honestly it was fantastic just having the opportunity to, to spend an hour and a half talking with somebody who's had the opportunity to take a little history from me, see how I, you know, deal with certain kind of, you know, questionnaires they always have you fill out. <laughs> um, but it was like really productive and, uh, you know, led me to some really interesting kind of feedback that I got about where she felt I was at and where maybe there were some things I could address and, and here's where counseling can probably help. And so, you know, I've got uh, you know, an initial action plan out of that. And uh, I, I'm very optimistic about um, that leading to some some really positive change. So, um, so why a psychiatrist? Yeah, because, you know, for me, I've always sort of felt that there was some combination of, you know, depression and anxiety, perhaps, and, uh, well, ADHD, if I'm being totally honest, um, uh, always been kind of a concern of mine for, well, since childhood, really. Um, and, you know, that was, it would give me the opportunity to talk through those questions, those concerns with a professional, sure. right? Who's, who's very, one of their very roles is to evaluate that. Yeah, and yeah. so, so I wanted to do that and I was totally comfortable with the idea that, that the outcome of that might be, Hey, nothing here to address pharmacologically therapy is probably the right course for you. Um, in fact, uh, both are recommended in my case. So I, that's great. Um, willing to do that and, and see that through. But, um, yeah, I, I felt like that was the right evaluation step to say, you know, do we have something here or should I, should I move on and, and go this other path? So I just wanted some support in doing that. And that seemed like the right way to go. So any surprises? Um, I don't know if I'd say surprises. I think some of the, some of the real value in talking to a third party, someone who doesn't know you well, um, is the sort of, uh, progressions of events or similarities between things that may have transpired in your life over time might be more evident to them. Like their pattern recognition is going to be better than yours because mine is cluttered with, I have, you know, 50 years of memories or 48 plus years of memories, um, that I'm using the cloud at plus my own bias, yeah. like anything, just like when you're reporting your physical health conditions to your, you know, your regular doctor, <laughs> you know, you've got a bias you're going in with and right. they're being objective, right? Same thing. I feel like mental health is one of those things that we all neglect to a large degree um, yeah. for, for many different reasons, but it's not something I've really explored personally. Most adults I talk to, especially, you know, no older than us. So people who are 30 to 50, I mean, a surprising number of them do very little to address physical health kind of preventative care. Right. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know how many people you, you know that don't get regular physicals, but a there's lot. a lot of them, <laughs> uh, which is also scary, right? Because you're just putting off finding out the things that are going and maybe missing the opportunity to address something that is only going to proceed more and more rapid as you age. So I've always been good about that stuff. So I would say maybe part of it is it's just easier to focus on things that are very tangible. Yeah. And so I was very good about you know, always getting my physical Get and my test. blood work and yeah. doing my tests on time and my vaccines on time. Like that stuff's easy. I can control it very well. And it's also, I think, very easy to go through life 
and make excuses, right? I can rationalize yeah. anything like, well, I feel this way or I snapped at this person because, you know, um, I'm just uh, underwater at work. There's just too much happening. I have a young child, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, we just all we make excuses. And, and sometimes there's validity to that, of course, right? People genuinely are busy and they are under stress and, you know, whatever. But that doesn't mean there isn't also something organically that could be made better, right? Uh, we barely understand how our brains work. And so I think it's easy to just sweep that aside. And, I, and for me, at least, the last three years, I've been so much more reflective about how I'm feeling and why maybe I feel that way and why I act the way I do. Some of that we've explored on this show. Some of it is stuff that I've just kind of thought a lot about and written about some of on the blog. Some of it's conversations Lori and I have had. Some of it's just you know, being more willing to accept the idea that like, oh, well, I have all these things in my favor. And, and maybe this is a con this, maybe this harkens back. Let me interrupt myself. <laughs> maybe this harkens back to a uh, text exchange, <laughs> text exchange. It is you and I had with a good friend of ours where I felt like I was, you know, I had no ill intent here. The, the individual was just sort of wondering like, why were people talking about stress and retirement, you know, to talking about the Doc G interview that we yeah. had done, yep. you know, why is there this stress? Why is there this disappointment? Why is there this concern? And thinking about that got me also thinking, well, all those things could be true, but maybe there's actually something else at issue. There's something else underlying the anxiety I had or the you know sadness I was feeling about certain things. And so the more I thought about this, the more I talked to other people about how they were feeling, this friend I referenced earlier, and how they were feeling now, got me thinking like, well, why the heck can't that be the case with me, right? Maybe there's something there I need to understand better and address, and whether that's through dialogue with, with somebody who can help me navigate that, or maybe there is pharmacological benefit that I could have from an SSRI or something like that, and or both solutions, honestly. Um, and so I think that was what it was about. I don't think it was like retirement didn't trigger mental health. I think retirement gave me the opportunity or kind of hit me in the face with, hey, maybe there's an opportunity here. And maybe it's all those long walks or what have you, just introspection. I don't really know. Um, but I would say that I'm glad that, you know, through this kind of collection of actions, these conversations, the book, listening to other people, I said, you know, I need to take my holistic health more seriously. And that means, yeah, activity is great, but maybe being a little more thoughtful about the type of activity, right? It's not just about getting out, like, you know, specific, you know, heart rate activity, you know, zone two for this and, you know, zone five for this. And, you know, from a nutrition perspective, you know, think about these things. So it's just, you know, these are more aspects of health that I guess I want to be more serious about, not obsessive and weird, but just <laughs> like being comprehensive. Like that seems like a really good thing, right? Sleep. I've never been a good sleeper. So, you know, getting off my rear end and saying, hey, doctor, my physician, uh, this is something I've dealt with for a long time. Maybe it is time for another sleep study, right? Thinking hard about sleep hygiene, you know, things like that. So some of that's easy. Some of that's harder. But, you know, it's in the big picture. If you want to be happy and enjoy your whatever your lifespan is, well, increasing your health span sounds like a great thing. So I guess that at the end of the day is why I'm being more serious. In the previous video, uh, you and I talked about things that you were doing, you were exploring getting your pilot's license and like, oh, I don't know if this is for me or not. And yeah. this this kind of strikes me as something that could be one of those long-term projects for you that you really get into. And I don't know if it means tracking macronutrients and, you know, whatever, yeah. you know, fitness, calories burned, all that becomes this kind of like a stand in for a job, you know, some kind of vocation for you to, to yeah. really dive in. Like it seems that seems to fit your personality really well. Um, so it's no surprise to me that you would like go in and then also go really, really deep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, all of it's going to be a lot less expensive than a pilot's license. So <laughs> exactly. you know, it's probably smart. You can, you, and the payoff is much better memberships man. as you want. And you'd still be way under <laughs> less dangerous yeah. too. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, do you think, do you think there's, I mean, how do you react to the idea that, you know, while you're, you know, you're somebody who keeps incredibly busy with your job and yes, you can, you have more control over your schedule than maybe some people listening might, but you still, you have a lot on your plate. You keep busy. You've got a family. I mean, do, is it valid that 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 a thought that you might be also somebody putting these things out of mind and just head down focus? Or, I mean, what do you <laughs> yeah, think? Yeah, I mean, I I mean, of course. And you know, when your friends bring it up, and I mean, the more 
people our age are willing to start talking about this. And, and maybe this is just society as a whole. It's more accepted that, you know, if you have issues that need addressing, it's okay to talk about them. It's, it doesn't have to be this um, yeah. stigma associated with it. And, um, you know, I know a lot of people who have been in this situation and I, I think most people that I know and people, especially close to me have, they've gone the therapy route instead of, um, yeah. you know, the route that you took, um, because there was, you were seeking, uh, you know, other answers, right? Is there some pharmacological solution to this mm -hmm. problem too? And, um, so the, the therapy thing I think is it's, it's appealing to me because what I've seen to the people yeah. that are close to me, um, to see what they've gotten out of it. A lot of times I think you can feel like th this is a, this is a problem of my own making and I don't really have an answer for why it is the way it is. And right. the, what I've seen come out of it is an answer and um, a means of dealing with it and acceptance. Right. Like, this is who I am and this is why it is this way. And um, when these problems kind of surface time and again, because they don't just go away, you know, you have a you have a framework for dealing with it. And I, that is something that's really appealing to me because I, I, I mean, I'm certain we all could benefit from, totally from this kind of, you know, holistic treatment of our own personal health that includes physical and mental well being. And it's something I've ignored for a long time. It's also something that, and the reason I asked you, like, how did you find this person is because it's, it's not easy. I live in a no. pretty rural place and, um, having done some investigations here into some of this in the past for other loved ones, yeah. it's very difficult to find somebody willing to take you on. And I realize there are online resources now that are starting to take that place, but, um, it's, it's yeah. not like you can just call up a healthcare provider that's in network and they'll just say, yeah, come on down on Wednesday and I'll see you. Or, you know, it doesn't work like that with the mental no. health industry. You know, this is a very interesting topic to me and I'm glad that you're digging into it. Be and, and it's, Thanks. it's also not an easy thing to share. Um, and no, I it's not, <laughs> <laughs> it's not, and I interrupt you there, but, um, yeah. you know, I thought about, you know, from the first day I had that, that, that doctor's appointment, I thought about like, is this something, you know, who do I want to talk to about this? Yeah. Who would I share this with? Obviously my family, but you know, and, and you and a couple of other close friends, but you know, maybe nobody else, right? Cause, Oh, there's, you know, I, I don't want, I, I, first of all, I'm somebody who doesn't want people to worry about me. Even when I need help, I'm like loath to ask for it, which is a problem. But you know, it's because I want to, I want it to, honestly, I always want it to appear like I have all the answers. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know. And I know that's a challenge and you experiencing on the other end of this, this camera, because you know, sometimes I'm loath to be completely vulnerable. But, um, you know, one of the things that I think pushed me over the edge is I told a good friend this kind of tale two days ago and they were really just kind of interested. And at the end of it, they asked me for the phone number of the doctor I'd seen. Um, and they talked about why they thought they needed to, to talk to somebody. And I was like, well, geez, I mean, that's, that's amazing. Um, I, I feel, I'm so glad I shared it with him and I, I hope this individual gets whatever support they're looking for, whether it's from that person or otherwise. But I thought, well, surely, there are people in our audience, retired or otherwise, who may be on the fence about, you know, oh, I would be interested in, in getting some counseling or talking to my doctor about this, and they just haven't. And so if it tips just one person towards that, well, that vulnerability was worth it. So yeah, it's weird to be talking about that. I still have no idea when I look <laughs> at the footage what I would want to keep and not. Uh, and I know you would respect that, but um, I think it's such an important issue that what do I have to lose? Right. In being honest, um, if somebody doesn't receive it in the spirit it's intended or wants to, you know, wants to poo poo it because they are of a generation that that doesn't value mental health. Well, that's too bad for them. Um, my hope is that like any content you and I share with the world, even if it's a difficult conversation for us, if people find value in it, then we've done the right thing. And if it feels good to us when we see how people react to it, well, that's just validation that we did the right thing. Yeah, for sure. I feel like um, you and I, our discussions over the past couple of years here, I can sense that there's something missing from retirement for you, but I can't, I can never quite put my finger on it. And do you, th do you think that's <laughs> like, does this play into that? Is this just some? I mean, were you yeah. seeking that answer too? Because I think one of the things when we're talking about health, um, 
with respect to early retirement is there is there is a real danger of you know cognitive decline and a loss of sense of purpose yeah. and isolation and all of these things are are really damaging to your health span. Like hundred percent, they actually are. And I just wonder, like, is, do you think you're kind of discovering that now? <laughs> yeah, it's a this uh, is the missing it's, piece. It's a great question, and maybe it is because you know maybe. You know, one of the reasons I loved juggling so many different things in, over my career and liked multitasking and why, is the same reason I'm trying to fill my time with activity presently. And that's because it gives you things to focus on other than kind of looking inward yeah. when you might need to, to say, well, well, do I like the way I reacted to that situation? And might there be something I could do differently or learn about myself or or address such that I would have handled it better and I'd be happier, generally speaking, because the, 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 the one conclusion I think is, or the one observation I think is very important to share is that you can both be very happy, have a lot of gratitude uh, about your life, the things you're going sure. through, the success you've had, and I have all of that, Yeah. but also find yourself seeking answers about things that aren't as positive as you they perhaps could be, right? And, and that's kind of how I entered this conversation with the psychiatrist, as I said, you know, she said, you know, why, why do you want to have this conversation? And what do you hope to get out of it? And I've said something like, I have all of these things in my favor, all these things have gone right. And I have this amazing family and relationship with my wife and all this opportunity ahead of me. And yet I'm not, I don't think I'm as happy as I should be about all of that. And, um, and I think that's been the case for a long time. And that kind of provoked a, a whole kind of series of exchanges that were really valuable to me. Um, and that's just getting started. So, uh, I think that's the sort of underlying nature of it. I think it's having this space to really contemplate much more being sort of forced to confront some of the things happening in my life, uh, and talk about them via, you know, conversations with you, conversations with others in the community, um, and, uh, others in my life is just, Hey, um, there's something here and I've never taken the time to really think through them kind of earnestly because it's just so easy to, you know, def defer those things when you're busy, you're thinking about other priorities, rightfully perhaps. Um, but it's also a convenient excuse. For as well as I think I know you, there's still a lot of things that I don't know about you. And, you know, I think there's, but I mean, it's like that with everybody, right? The, For you, sure. You have these kind of this inner dialogue, you know, that, that dialogue you have with yourself, it's, it's the loudest voice in your head and it's not always made manifest in regular conversations. And especially in a situation like this, where we're uh, broadcasting and sharing it with a lot of different people. Um, so yeah. I, I do think it's courageous for, of you to, to share it openly. And, you know, I, I hope it, in, things get better for you in that respect. And it's, you know, it's something that you're working on. I think that's, a, a, you know, I have a lot of respect for that. So. Thanks. I yeah. appreciate it. I am, uh, I am doing well. Uh, <laughs> I know that I can be even better and I can be better for my family, better for my friends, better for myself. And this is all, as we said, a part of just thinking about health and well-being holistically. And, you know, you're never going to achieve nirvana. And that isn't my goal to achieve perfect enlightenment. But, you know, I want to spend my days that I have in this life as happy as I can be in the company of people I want to spend my time with. And, you know, that means being as positive in an individual as I can and knowing enough about myself that I can carry myself in situations the way I'd like to all the time. And, uh, I know I don't succeed in that hundred percent of the time to date. And that means there's opportunity. And so like anything, I want to optimize it. <laughs> I mean, there's so many of these issues to deal with in, early retirement, Jay, you know, I mean, we think of reaching early retirement as this kind of de-stressing moment, right? But it, it introduces a different set of challenges, you know, social isolation. Um, if you're traveling, you're, you're without a community, you know, you're doing a lot of different things. You may actually even still have financial stress, right? I know sure. you had some worries. Am I withdrawing too much, too little, you know, for all of these things that we try and plan for and get right. Early retirement does present some special challenges. And I, I'm concerned about the loss of 
you know, sense of purpose. I'm definitely concerned about that. We talked about that yeah. in a recent episode. And so it's all, you know, health is a work in progress. And I think you're right to focus on it. And I, I really appreciate the gift of the book because it's been so far, man, it's been a great book. I, I, I can highly recommend it. Can you say the name of that again? Yeah, it's called Outlive. And I believe the subtitle is The Science and Art of Longevity. And it's by Peter Atia. And I'll link to it in the show notes as well so that people can have an easy kind of link out to read more about it. But uh, yeah, I'm so glad that you're enjoying it. And I think him hearing him talk about his own mental health struggles, this like infinitely successful person. Yeah. Right. In such candor as he goes to is is remarkable and rare. Uh, so I think it's just uh, I think that content alone would be so helpful for anybody to to see. So I'm glad you're enjoying it. I hope you enjoy the rest of it. And uh, anyone in our audience who reads it, I, I would hope the same for them. So, you know, I I don't think this episode will be among our most popular. But for me, this I would be so elated if it was, despite the, the increased vulnerability it would provide for me, because, you know, I love when people tell us, viewers, the reason they watch this show is the, you know, unfiltered, unscripted, very personal conversations we have, you know, and some of them even tell us, I don't come to you primarily for financial modeling discussions or, you know, the safe withdrawal rate toolbox. They say it's the everything else. And so I don't know about you, man. I've watched a lot of content and read a lot of content over the years in this space, and you don't hear a lot of conversation about mental health. Physical health, some, still not nearly enough. I'm just glad to share it with anyone who is here to view or listen to this conversation. And of course, above all, I'm, I'm happy to have it with you. So I'm appreciative you were willing to talk about this topic. I, I appreciate the vulnerability. I also, it also makes me think about this idea that, you know, um, it's probably going to sound obvious when I say it, but, um, you know, the moments of most growth that I've had in my life, whether that's personal growth or in my business as an entrepreneur, um, they're always preceded by these moments of extreme incompetence. And I think being able to recognize and acknowledge that incompetence is just, it's, it's the next step to growing. And I yeah. applaud you for doing that publicly. And I'm glad that it's going to you know help you move forward in your life and make a better life for you and your family. So again, I really appreciate these conversations, man. And, uh, yeah, it was good. Good catching up. I appreciate it. It's a great conversation. Thanks. And uh, yeah, have a great rest of your week. Cheers. You too, man.